is that you talking or is that the wine talking? He says, I mean, she says, that's me talking to the wine. So we, we don't, we, that's not good. Uh, we, we, we don't want that. We want to be connected. Um, you mentioned every man's battle. You know, this, the book starts with a story of me coming up uh, Highway 1 uh, to Oxnard. I was going to testify for a hospital that wanted to do an alcohol and drug treatment center. And uh, I had been in California just a little while, and I had just purchased a 1973, which is about 10 years old or so, a 73, it was a 350, Mercedes 350 SL, not 450 SL. I was so proud of this convertible. And uh, I was coming up the coast, and uh, sadly, uh, I was going up the coast on, on Highway 1, and a, a woman in a bikini was jogging down the other direction. Uh, if she had been jogging my direction, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But she, I, I was from Texas. Thankfully, thank the Lord, we didn't have women jogging in bikinis there. Because <laughs> if you've ever seen some of the women from Texas, it's not good. So uh, anyway, so I see her, and, and I'm in stop and go traffic and with my new little convertible, driving up here, having a great time. And I, I just follow her and, and turn my head uh, almost screwed the thing off. I was so <laughs> fixated on her. And the car in front of me stopped and I crashed this brand new uh, used car that I have that I was so proud of, you know. And so instantly I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell my wife that I had to swerve to miss that puppy? And, uh, <laughs> but at some point, at some point, um, all of us uh, have to decide, okay, uh, that's it. Some of us, we, we ruin a car over it. Some of us, a marriage. Some um, literally have to have all their freedom taken away before they finally make a decision about sexual integrity. Uh, I was born in 1953, which is the uh, same year that Playboy was born. And uh, my grandfather had an office, and he had... Uh, the very first uh, centerfold, which is Marilyn Monroe, uh, I can tell you what that looks like right now. And um, for some reason, my staunch uh, Southern Baptist parents thought it was okay for me to be in my grandfather's office with all of these naked women uh, up on the wall. And so I was introduced to pornography and, and all of that uh, very, very young. And uh, it was a struggle and a battle for a lot of my life. So this isn't something that I read a research paper on one day and thought that'd be an interesting thing for a book. Uh, it has been a struggle. And if any of you do struggle, well, you're like most everybody else. But when you find a way uh, to have victory in this area and you, you actually put your head on the pillow, at night, and you've, you've had a, a day where you've had success, and, and you were clean, and, and you didn't do anything uh, that you're ashamed of. It's a great way to live, and you just put one of those days uh, on the other. And we do an intensive, for some people the book isn't enough, and we do an intensive, uh, and we've had over 12,000 men come for a weekend, and you know, they come, they don't want to be here. Most of them, their wife said, you either go or you go. And most of them don't want to be there. They get there on a Friday afternoon. They hate being there. They either think they have the worst problem or the least amount of problem ever. And by the time Sunday rolls around, um, you know, they're ready to take a road trip with the guys that are there. It's, it's a bonding time and because we tell them that life can be different and we tell them how. A lot of times we are told how bad we are for looking at pornography and how horrible it is, but nobody tells us what to do. And that's one of the reasons that Every Man's Battle uh, has been a, a very, very successful book. One of the words, a uh, big word, it was a big word for me, was the word objectification. And um, it, it simply means, and I didn't even know it was a problem, that you look at women as a set of body parts. And if you look at a woman as a set of body parts for your pleasure, you will not see her as a full, complete human being with, it, with full spectrum of emotions. I think sometimes that's why they are so emotional, to remind us that they are human and they're doing a good job. Um, 
<laughs> but, but you cannot, you cannot have the kind of intimacy that God wants you to have with a woman if in the back of your mind you've never really recovered from this thing and a woman is still kind of an object for your pleasure. Uh, there's another big word that I learned from a dentist. When I was in college, I bit into a chicken fried steak. Uh, there was a metal filing in there uh, that split my uh, back molar in two. And the dentist said, well, it looks like we've got bifurcation. I said, what's that? Because I didn't know he was like a sex doctor or something. And, uh, and he says, uh, well, it's totally split. So there's this bifurcation myth about marriage, that I can lust after women, I can treat them as objects, I can use them for my own gratification, and wow, eat the wedding cake, and I am going to be a man of integrity, character, and we're just going to have the best sexual experience ever. It just doesn't happen. And so many people struggle, and they think, well, once I'm married, I won't struggle. You will struggle. It gets worse after you get married because you think, well, this marriage was supposed to clear this thing up. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but women have some expectations that are kind of hard to meet. And so when you don't meet them, then you kind of feel entitled to just go off and do whatever. When I married my wife, I told her, um, you know, we didn't have sex before we got married. And I said, on the honeymoon, I am going to send you to the moon. Now, that is not the dumbest thing I've ever said, but it's up there. And, uh, and um, so we had the honeymoon, and I don't think she got much above the hedges, uh, much less to the moon. So... Um, about, about two months after we got back home, uh, she's looking online. She goes, hey, look at this. There's a, a physician couple out in Arizona. And you go there for four days, and they teach you all the things that you don't know about how to have sex. And, and my reaction was, oh, that is so it." Oh, I say, okay, fine. So we went, and, um, and we learned a lot. But I think that the reason that I was so inadequate and ill-equipped and incompetent is because at age five, I started to become a pornified man. Now, a pornified man is really, if you're a pornified person, uh, you do not treat a woman as an equal. Uh, you actually don't, uh, they say, the research says, you don't really, a uh, truly pornified man, not really excited about having a daughter because you see them as less than. And um, it's really interesting that um, pornography has an impact, a physiological, chemical uh, impact and reaction that heroin doesn't have. If you uh, shoot some heroin, and some of you look like you, you have, and uh, <laughs> the, you get a spike, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you get a spike of, of dopamine. And it's a pretty high spike. I've never had heroin. I understand it's one of the greatest highs. No wonder people get so hooked on it. You have a spike of dopamine, and, uh, and that's the, the addictive chemical inside of you. That dopamine can be produced by a lot of different things. If you gamble uh, and you win, or if you anticipate winning, you, you're pumping dopamine into your system. Well, pornography, when you have an uh, experience of sexual gratification from pornography, you also have a spike of dopamine. And um, it, it's as addictive as the spike of dopamine from heroin. But there's something else that happens. Uh, most of you, your wives have complained that after you have sex, you, wanna, you just fall asleep and, and on top of them or something. It's, just, it's embarrassing for us men because you have this sense of well-being. And you are at peace with the world after you have had a wonderful sexual experience. Well, the reason that that's there is there is a, another chemical that spikes in the system, and it's called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is the chemical that a mother secretes while she's nursing her baby. It is a bonding hormone. So that when a mother, let's just say a cave woman, was nursing her baby, oxytocin is pumping through her system, and as she nurses, it's pumping into the baby's system, and they bond together. It also has another effect. Whatever the mother, the cave woman, was bonded to, 
she wanted to protect and became very aggressive toward anything that was a threat. So when the lion outside the cave roared, she is ready to go fight that lion to protect the baby she's bonded to. Now you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. A lot of men don't know why they absolutely hate the wife that they married or are so angry at her or are so full of rage and it's because they've been using pornography and they have bonded with the pornography because of the oxytocin that gets out throughout your system when you have a sexual experience. So they're bonded to it and when she gets suspicious or asks what are you looking at on the computer or demands something <laughs> You are so aggressive toward her because she is a threat to what you have bonded to, the pornography. Well, a lot of men didn't really understand that until literally this past couple of years is when they, they have done the research and figured out the power of pornography, not only to keep us addicted to it, but to be aggressive toward anything that is a threat to it. Now, um, I don't know if you've ever read anything about Hugh Hefner. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, there was the Playboy philosophy, which was really amazing, and, and you just thought that that's what you had to understand and be like uh, to be a great sexual partner. But if you were to uh, purchase a Time magazine this past April uh, the 11th, you would have seen it, the whole uh, the cover had the word porn on it. And it was a, a pretty extensive article about 16-year-olds. 16-year-olds who have given up looking at pornography. Not because uh, Campus Crusade came in and did a great job of winning them to Christ or they wanted to get back in touch with God or anything like that. It had nothing to do with it. These 16-year-olds discovered that they were so hooked on pornography, so uh, involved with it, that they couldn't have sex with their girlfriends. They were impotent at 16. They needed Viagra at 16. Because when you are, let's say you're lining up videos, clicking, 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 uh, you can't reproduce that kind of high with a, a real life human being. And so it was this article on 16 year olds saying, we're not ever doing that again because we can't function as a man. Pornography literally robs you of manhood. I could show you a picture of a woman. She would, you would all say, I think, unless uh, you were blind, that she would be a, what we'd call a 10, or Donald Trump would call her a 10. Um, so, I mean, just a beautiful woman. She married her high school sweetheart, didn't know he had a pornography problem, couldn't perform on honeymoon night, and he takes a penthouse centerfold, puts it behind, beside this beautiful woman so that he could get an erection and have sex with her. Now, they eventually divorced, of course. But, you know, that, that kind of humiliation is what happens. Uh, and then there are so many variations to those obvious examples that I've given. And when we wonder, why is it that I just don't get it right with this woman? It could be because a woman is an object. And, and sex is something that's all about you and your pleasure and your experience and it's all about the front of you and has very little to do with what she's all about until you finally say, I want it to be different. And when you do, it can be totally different. There are three things that I think a woman is looking for from a man. The first thing is clarity. She wants to know that when you tell her something, it is absolutely the truth, that you don't fudge on the truth. You don't leave things out. And that you don't have a reason to leave things out. That you're confident in yourself and what you're doing so that you ha she has clarity. This is who the man is and I trust him. She wants security also. Clarity and security. You become, if you want your wife to truly be drawn to you, become the most predictable person in the world. You're always where you say you are become responsible, predictable, and, and become that person that she can rely on to find the answer to something that you don't understand rather than do what we all tend to do, act like we're an expert on everything. Her security comes when she knows that you'll go outside and get the answer if you don't have the answer. 
And then there's this serenity that you instill peace and calm and serenity within her. Well, if, if you are covering up a porn problem, you will not produce clarity in your relationship. If you're doing things with time other than stuff that she's aware of, there will not be security and that she will not be a happy, calm, pleasant person to live with and you will pay that price. There's a standard that we talk about in every man's battle for all sexual behavior. To be known by your wife. Everything that you do is known by your wife. No secrets. And it's approved by your wife. She knows about it. She approves it. And third thing, She's involved with it. I mean, really, that is that is the standard. That's different than standing up in a church and saying, I'm never going to have sex with another woman. I'm going to marry this person and be faithful for a lifetime. But to be so faithful that all sexual experiences are known by, approved by, and involving her produces that kind of security that she's looking for and clarity. And it provides a peace where she doesn't have to be uh, a woman to get your attention or try to get you to change. There was a, a man who's, um, it was his 50th anniversary, and uh, a reporter uh, wanted to find out what was going on there, and, and so he found out what happened on the 50th anniversary. The guy comes down the stairs, wife's been preparing breakfast on their 50th anniversary, got a little tear coming down his cheek, and wife said, uh, oh, this is so beautiful. Here we are, 50th anniversary, and, and you're crying like that. What, what are you feeling, honey? And he said, well, if you remember, when we got married, you were pregnant. <laughs> Your father had a shotgun and said, you don't marry here, I'm going to lock you up for 50 years, and today I would have been a free man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, but some of us have been there. And um, you want to be a free man, and you think if she could just get it together, things would be different. But what are we responsible for? We're responsible for our side of the street and um, not trying to control her, change her, cure her, and certainly not to compare her. But when we give up some of the things that are just part of being a man, we get to be a husband, a boyfriend, a potential husband, a potential boyfriend, or just a person that is happy being single because maybe that's just not, marriage is not what God wants you to do. But if we continue to copy the way the world goes, we're probably going to be very, very disappointed with our lives as men. That's what I've seen in talking to guys over the past few years. Anybody have a, a question or a comment that you want to make? Humiliate yourself. Yes, yes, there. Yes, you. <laughs> The, uh, the research say about married couples that watch porn together? Well, um, the, most of the secular research would say that that's okay. But if you um, truly talk to a woman who's gotten involved with it, um, on down the road, a lot of times she is now hooked on it herself and is very uh, unsatisfied without... Uh, looking at that and that being a part of a sexual relationship. Uh, if there's anything that has increased uh, in our, on our radio show it's, and the people that we deal with, it's the amount of women that are involved in pornography. People used to say, oh, you know, women, they, they won't do that because they're not visual like men. But it is a, a quick fix that doesn't solve anything. And oftentimes uh, the woman is very, very unhappy that she got involved with it kind of realizes she was manipulated into it, and then sometimes she even gets hooked on it. Great question. Anybody else have a... Raising boys or dads. Yeah. Age, tools, mm -hmm. topics. Well, Solomon is 10. When he was 9, I told him we were going to go up to Lake Michigan, we were going to camp out, and I was going to spend three days talking to him about all this stuff. When, when we got there, I said, uh, Solomon, your mom said you've got a lot of questions about what we're going to talk about this weekend. So go ahead. Let's start with your first question. He said, okay, got embarrassed, but Dad, what is communism? <laughs> Communism. 
<laughs> kind, of, kind of sounds sexual, you know. You, um, for um, it's worse. Yeah. yeah, it is. For Solomon, I just used the book we wrote years ago called "Preparing Your Son." for every young man's battle. And the good thing about it is about half of it, you can read it and kind of prepare yourself. But the other half, you just read it out loud to the young boy. And then uh, for older young men, there's uh, every young man's battle. And then there is a workbook for older single guys. Every single man's battle. And then uh, every man's battle for adults. But it, it works. I mean, I used it. And it really does work. It does the job. The problem is, you know, you have to be talking about this from the time they're six or seven or you'll miss it. Because kids get a hold of a cell phone and they just put it right up to a kid's face. You can't say, well, I'm going to protect my child because I'm not going to let them have an iPad or a phone or anything like that. It doesn't matter. If they're around other kids that do, it's going to be right in their face. Look at this. So, um, you know, I've taught Solomon... Uh, to look away, you know, and he sees me look away most of the time. And, uh, but it's just a habit that we have, and, and we honor women in that way. Um, you know, who knows when you've got a 10-year-old um, what he's like when he's not with us. But so far, it seems to have been a great thing that we connected over this very, very early. And I think just letting a, a young boy whether he's your grandson or your son, know that you're a resource, a safe resource. You'll never embarrass him. And me and this camper trying not to laugh at communism, uh, that was tough. <laughs> but I had to be sure he knew that there was nothing that was out of line for him to ask. So uh, you just have to be sure that you initiate it early and that you do it thoroughly and you never stop doing it. You never stop talking about it. What about with girls? Okay. Like I didn't write a book about that. <laughs> well, um, yeah. well, I have a 25-year-old daughter. And uh, when I went to seminary, I, I really felt like I was called to be a revealer of the truth about my life. So everything, my promiscuity, uh, abortion, all this stuff I've written about in books. And people said to me, uh, oh, you shouldn't do that. I mean, you've got this daughter. If she reads that, she's going to have an excuse to go do the same thing. And my opinion was, and I w I've said it frequently, if my daughter needs an excuse to have sex with somebody, she'll find that excuse. But she has to make the decision. Well, you know, she went to Laguna Beach High School where everybody drinks and smokes pot while they're having sex with each other. And it's just <laughs> rampant. But she, she graduated a virgin, never touched a drop of alcohol, never smoked a marijuana uh, joint. And people said, well, how did you raise somebody like that? You must be the most amazing. I said, hey, you'd have to raise her. She had it. There's no formula that parents have that's going to be 100% success. The child has to make that decision. But I was always there for her. I helped her pick out swimsuits, teaching her what boys think. I gave tremendous value to who she was as a human being. Uh, not the way she looked, not uh, the things she did. She's a great soccer player, played in college. But it was always trying to connect with her heart as a human uh, and giving her that value so that she didn't need to have sex with some guy to feel valuable. Or she didn't need to have sex with a guy to get the attention of a man. So um, it's tough with girls. And I've got a seven-year-old, Amelia, and that it's going to be tougher than it was with Madeline just because of the culture. But I'm ready for the task. You just have to have a connection. And it's no guarantee. But it's the best, it's the best chance of not the girl not getting in trouble. And it's the best chance of, if they get involved, coming back out of that. Because they've seen that it doesn't really produce the fulfillment they're looking for. Anybody have an easier question than the girl, uh, <laughs> girl thing? I, I think, I think the, the girls really need to hear from their dads all the time. Absolutely. I think, I think dads with the girls, like, they can rely on the woman, the, the, the wife, to kind of disseminate that information. But, um, I stepped in more in one puddle talking to my girls about that growing yeah. up and letting, letting them know what, how boys operate and yeah. what their expectations are and, and, and just prepare yourself. And, but don't, dads, don't be afraid to talk to your dad. No. 
and we, we have a book for girls too uh, that Shannon Etheridge and I did it's preparing your daughter for every young woman's battle and uh, it does does the job it gets you in there and talking about the, the important stuff well uh, let me let me just uh, encourage you over dinner um, if you're courageous enough to do it uh, maybe you could share with each other uh, some area that is a struggle for you. Maybe you just open up. You don't have to say, okay, I'm a sex addict and, I, and I'm going to hell. Uh, no, you, but maybe you could just share um, some area that's really tough for you. For some people, it's, it's internet. For others, it's movies. For others, it's, it's just everything. Younger women, whatever. But to be able to just share, hey, that's a struggle for me. Sometimes you get some insight from somebody else who's got that same struggle and they've made some progress or made some strides strides in the right direction. Let me pray for you uh, before we eat. Lord, I thank you for every man that's here, every man that knows he's a man and showed up. God, thank you for this. Thank you for this church. And uh, I just pray your, your divine hand of protection on each man here. I pray for your uh, wisdom and insight to infiltrate the hearts of these men, minds of these men. And I pray that uh, you would honor their commitment to either stop or do better, to uh, connect with another man, to have victory in this very, very tough area. I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. You bet. Yeah. Yeah.